Day Institute on World Affairs being held at Iowa State University. I'm Jean Adams from the Department of Economics, and it is my pleasure to introduce the two very distinguished speakers we have with us tonight and to moderate their debate. Yes. What do I need to do? <laughs> Is this one? Can you hear me now? No. Good. <laughs> what about now? Yeah. <laughs> Let me start over again. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture, which is part of a six-day institute on world affairs being held here at Iowa State. I'm Jean Adams from the Department of Economics, and it is my pleasure to introduce the two very distinguished speakers we have with us tonight and to moderate their debate on the topic, Has China Lost the Road to Socialism? Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to remind you of the events planned for tomorrow. At noon tomorrow in the Pioneer Room, the movie The Forbidden City will be shown. At 3 o'clock tomorrow in the Pioneer Room, Peggy Patrick will lecture on art in China. She has recently returned from a trip emphasizing art aspects of the Chinese system. At 8 o'clock tomorrow in this room, Gerald Tannenbaum will introduce the film Dr. Norman Bethune and discuss filmmaking in China. Tonight we have with us two gentlemen, both of whom were here last year for the National Affairs Institute when the topic of America's economic system was under discussion. Because of the enthusiasm they generated and some of the issues that were raised when they were here last year, we have asked them to come back tonight and discuss the specific topic before us. Our first speaker tonight will be John Gurley. Dr. Gurley is a well-known professor of economics at Stanford University. His association with Stanford has been a long and varied one. He did both his undergraduate and graduate work at Stanford and returned there as a professor of economics in 1961. He teaches courses in the principles of economics, Marxian and radical economics, the development of China, and human biology, which is the study of the evolution of economic systems. Dr. Gurley has also taught at Princeton, the University of Maryland, and at a Japanese university. In 1971, he received the first of a Stanford University Award for Excellence in Teaching. Dr. Gurley has published a substantial body of work in the area of monetary theory, Dr. Gurley is well known for his 1960 book, co-authored with Shaw, and entitled Money in the Theory of Finance. His other works, his other books specifically, include Challengers to Capitalism, Marx, Lenin, and Mao, which was published in 1976, and China's Economy and the Maoist Strategy, published in 1976 by Monthly Review Press. In addition, he has written many scholarly articles. During his career, Dr. Gurley has been a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and from 1963 to 1968, he served as managing editor, editor of the American Economic Review. Please join me in welcoming back to Iowa State University, Dr. Gurley. Jean, thank you very much for a generous introduction and accurate uh, as, to, as to facts. Um, well, the question, the question is, has China lost the road to socialism? And in trying to answer that very difficult question, I want to present first several propositions about socialism in general that will serve as my guidelines. First of all, a socialist path is one that through central planning and the public ownership of the means of production eliminates the capital accumulation process and its consequences. That is, economic crises, the wealth poverty poles, and the capital export imperialism imperative, and at the same time leads to communism. That is, in short, to economic plenty and to a classless society. It's a path along which the working classes hold political power. My second proposition 
is that it is not likely that this path will be without twists and turns. Hence, steady progress through socialism toward communism is not to be expected. Third proposition is that a society starting along the socialist path from an economically backward position must greatly emphasize the building up of its productive forces. Whereas a society starting, from, starting along the socialist path from a very advanced economic position can afford to place more emphasis on achieving classlessness. In the first case, that is in the backward country's case, there is danger of allowing capitalist class divisions to form. In the second case, the advanced country case, the problem is to overcome long-standing, solid class divisions along capitalist lines. In each case, the socialist task is to find a method of pursuing both these goals simultaneously in such a way that the pursuit of one enhances the attainment of the other. That is, the policy task is to transform the goals from being substitutes for each other, that is, these goals of economic plenty and classlessness, to transform those two goals from being substitutes or trade-offs to being complements. Fourth, since socialism is, I think, subordinate to nationalism, which is one of the most potent ideologies in the world, socialism takes on very strong national forms and therefore arises in abundant varieties. Fifth, Although socialism exists in national forms, it is also a global system in which each socialist nation plays a definite continuing role in socialism's worldwide expansion. Each socialist nation, therefore, is both a national model and a link in an international chain. And it may play an important, even indispensable role in one or the other or in both, or in neither. Sixth, the first several waves of socialism, owing to the power of world capitalism, arise only through violent upheavals. The last socialisms, owing to the debility of the remnants of world capitalism, arise through relatively mild means. Those socialisms in between, owing to world capitalism's continuing, though waning, strength, are born in a variety of revolutionary and evolutionary ways. Though the national cultural traditions of a country swing the balance to one side or the other. Seventh, later socialisms have more options than earlier ones do regarding the paths through socialism toward communism. This wider field of maneuver comes from the accumulation of socialist experience over time and from the increasing protection offered to socialist nations the later they arise. Differing national and cultural traditions guarantee the use of this widening array of options by later socialist societies. And finally, as socialist states multiply, they arise in increasingly multiform ways. They are shaped by increasingly different national and cultural traditions. They pursue increasingly varied paths of socialist development, and they provide increasingly diverse links in the international expansion of socialism. For these reasons, frictions grow among the socialist states as they expand in number, leading to some fragmentation of world socialism. Now, those are the principles that uh, I propose uh, to serve as my guidelines in 
trying to answer the question, has China lost the road to socialism? My answer to the question is that there are many roads through socialism towards a communist society. And I would just suspect that there are probably, a, there's probably a variety of communist societies. That each road has many twists and turns and setbacks. And that the evidence that we have from China up to now on this issue is certainly not conclusive one way or the other. However, I'm going to take a stand on this. However, there are some reasons for believing that China is still on the socialist road. The evidence is that China's socialist institutions still seem intact. Her mode of production is not generating the effluvia of capitalist production. And the working classes, through the party, do not appear to have lost political power. While I do not believe that all of this evidence is solid, it does seem to be weighted on the side of my conclusion. I would like now to consider the evidence in just a little bit more detail. First, China continues to use national planning, and especially for the purpose of allocating the bulk of her resources and guiding her production from the allocation of those resources. The planning mechanism extends from Peking through the provinces, the prefectures, and counties, and all the way to some extent, but not to a great extent, all the way to some extent to the 50,000 communes. Not only agriculture, but many of the small industries of communes and brigades are woven into the national planning fabric. The important industries above these levels are state enterprises, managed either from the center or from local governmental units. And all are included in the planning mechanism. Almost all enterprises, whether agricultural, industrial, or commercial, are either collectives or state enterprises. Throughout the countryside, at the lowest levels, policies continue to be carried out to reduce economic disparities among teams, brigades, and so to move toward higher forms of socialism. On this last point, one bit of evidence regarding socialist intentions of the party is whether it is carrying out policies to raise the basic accounting unit in agriculture from the teams to the production brigades and eventually to the, com uh, to the communes. Now, while the evidence on this is mixed, it does suggest that socialism is moving forward. The party is strengthening and extending commune and brigade industries so that increasing shares of total income of these units come from such industrial and commercial activities and accrue to these units not to the production teams. This permits the brigades and the communes to reduce disparities. At the same time, the commune enterprises are linked closely to state enterprises at the county level, which allows the state to promote growth in these areas and to lessen disparities among communes. You see, you have a structure in the agricultural area of the counties where sort of basic planning takes place at the lowest political level, and then down to the 50,000 communes. There are approximately 2,000 counties uh, in China. So then you have, on the average, 25 communes in each one of these counties. And within the communes are production brigades and production teams at the lowest, at the lowest level. Now, the brigades themselves own and manage some industries which are being encouraged. The communes just above them do the same thing. The counties have their industries, which are really state enterprises managed by the county. The ones below them are collectives, collective ownership. Now, to the extent that those industries are thriving, encouraged and thriving, they gain income. And that income can be used, say, by the brigade 
to reduce the disparities, income disparities and other economic disparities, of the production teams below them. In the same way, the commune's income, which accrues to the commune, can be used to reduce the disparities among the brigades. And the state enterprises can also get into the same structure uh, to do the same thing with regard to the, to the communes. So as income and resources of brigades grow, and as disparities are reduced among the teams, the opportunities increase for moving the basic accounting unit from the teams to the brigades without unduly hurting the wealthier teams. That is, people then can uh, operate as though they are members of a larger unit, a brigade, rather than members of a team. And that has always been considered a step forward uh, in socialism, where one's fortunes are tied up, not with a family, not with a dozen families, but with a hundred families, and then on up until the means of production are owned by, by all the people. So the same opportunities then, the, these opportunities appear first at the brigade level, at the, at the uh, commune level, and, and so on, up the, planning, up the planning structure. But that mechanism for greater socialization throughout the countryside requires simultaneous effort at all levels. For if the brigades are to do their job in relation to their teams, they must be strengthened by the communes, which for analogous reasons, must be strengthened by the state enterprises one step up the ladder at the county level. This mechanism is still in place and as much evidence indicates is actively being fostered and used by the planning authorities for the extension of socialism. This is rather good evidence that China's new leaders intend to press toward fuller socialism where it counts among 80% of the country's population. Now second, there is no evidence as yet, as that I can see, of a capital accumulation process in China. That is in Marx's sense of the term, when he analyzed what capitalism was all about. If this process were underway, bureaucrats and enterprise managers would be forming a new class around the profits of enterprises. These profits would be guiding resource allocation through private markets that were usurping the planning mechanism. Business cycles would be underway. The new mode of production would be generating great wealth at one pole and an impoverished proletariat at the other. And in time, surplus capital would be seeking exploitation opportunities abroad. The evidence that we have does not support any of these things. Therefore, I conclude that this is further evidence that capitalism has not been restored in China. It is possible, however, that there has not been sufficient time for cycles to be generated, a reserve army of labor to be formed, and so on. So some extra caution is needed here. But the current situation and whatever trends can be seen do not, in my judgment, suggest a capitalist restoration. Third, the problem of whether the working classes have lost political power is really the problem of whether the party now represents the bourgeoisie. I do not think that one can answer this by looking at the class backgrounds of the present leaders. The answer is best sought in the policies being carried out and to a lesser extent in what is being said about them. As we all know, China is embarking on an all-out modernization drive, the stated aim of which is to make China a modern and powerful socialist country by the end of this century. This policy and aim is certainly in keeping with socialism. However, class struggles, which many believe are necessary to maintain the political power of the working classes and eventually to establish a classless society, have been demoted. A few years ago, a Central Committee directive stated that large-scale, turbulent class struggles of a mass character have in the main come to an end. And Chairman Hua Guofeng has more recently repeated this, basing himself on the notion that the old ruling classes no longer exist in China. 
However, he went on to say that since the influence of bourgeois and feudal ideologies continue, the class struggle itself must continue. So this does not rule out class struggles, but it does rule out another cultural revolution carried out on the scale of that of 1966-69, which, as we find out, find out more about that giant upheaval, may be all to the good. I put that in to challenge Paul Sweezy uh, uh, on this. <laughs> Furthermore, <laughs> that's it, Paul. <laughs> Furthermore, um, Chairman Hua cautioned that during the all-out drive for modernization, China should follow the four basic principles, which are to adhere, first, to the socialist road, secondly, to the dictatorship of the proletariat, thirdly, to leadership by the party, and finally, to Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. While the depreciation of class struggles is the principal policy change, there are others. Enterprise managers have been given a stronger hand. Enterprise profits are now a more important indicator of efficiency. Material incentives for rural and urban workers have been strengthened. Worker discipline has been tightened. And trade and investment with the West has been expanded. My assessment is that these have been marginal changes which do not threaten the socialist system. They would look to be much more than that to anyone who has been misled into thinking that all of these moves are sudden total breaks from the past policies. But they are not. Managerial responsibility has waxed and waned over the years. Moreover, at the present time, the party, while strengthening managers, is also promoting and extending worker participation within the factories in decision making. As to profits, they have always been an indicator of performance. And it should be noticed that they are still not an important indicator of resource allocation. Material incentives have dominated workers' lives throughout most of the socialist period. Worker discipline has been imposed periodically, and trade with the West began in earnest almost 20 years ago. Investment with foreign equity in China is new, but it is well under control, and up to now amounts to practically nothing. All in all, I do not believe that these policies do much to undermine socialist institutions or issue in a capitalist accumulation process with its attendant ills. Workers' interests are still strongly represented by the party. So in conclusion, it is my impression that China's economic base, including her social relations, have been a lot more stable over the past decade or decade and a half than have the statements from successive Chinese leaders about that economic base. So it is best to pay more attention to what China does and a bit less to what China says. Thank you. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Paul Sweezy. After he has had a chance to present his views on the topics, then we will give time to each of our speakers to make any comments on the other's view, and then we'll open up uh, to discussion and questions from the audience. Dr. Sweezy is one of the nation's most distinguished Marxist economists. He did his graduate work in economics at Harvard University, where he received his PhD degree and he also studied at the London School of Economics. During the 1930s, he returned to Harvard as a member of the faculty. He worked for various New Deal agencies, and during World War II, he served with the Office of Strategic Services. In 1949, Dr. Sweezy founded the Monthly Review with Leo Huberman, and he continues today as its co-editor. 
Monthly Review has been described as, quote, the most famous unknown magazine in America, <laughs> and is credited with keeping socialist thought alive in the United States through such trying times as the McCarthy period. In addition, Dr. Sweezy has authored and co-authored many books and articles. His book, The Theory of Capitalist Development, published in 1942, is still today widely regarded in this and other countries as the best introduction to and summary of Marxian economic theory. Also very widely read is a book he co-authored in 1966 with the late Paul Buran entitled Monopoly Capital, an Essay on the American Economic and Social Order. Dr. Sweezy has just returned this week from a long series of lectures in Japan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sweezy back to the United States and back here. Thank you very much, Jean. And it's very good to be back with all of you again. I enjoyed last year's opportunity, although the weather was a little bit less clement last year, as I remember. It was about 15 below zero every day and lots of snow on the ground. By comparison, this is like the tropics. <laughs> now, the... Uh, Jack Gurley and I are really not going to have a debate because with a great deal of what he said, I agree. In fact, put in his terms of reference, I don't think I could disagree. But I would stress other terms of reference uh, as being rather more important and also more interesting. <laughs> It seems to me that the question is not at all whether China is restoring capitalism. I don't think that is, is any evidence to that effect. But I also don't think the Soviet Union ever dis, uh, restored capitalism. Now, and I think that the road that China and the Soviet Union traveled during a considerable part of the period between the 1949 victory of the Chinese Communist Party and the death of Chairman Mao in 1975, the road that China traveled during that period in many important respects differed from that which the Soviet Union traveled in that period and indeed considerably before that period. And it seems to me that the most interesting question, and in the long run the most important question, is not whether capitalism is being restored. I think that's a, a, essentially a, a pseudo question. But whether China is persisting on a path different from, more original than, and in my opinion more hopeful than, that which the Soviet Union has been traveling, or whether it is now, and particularly in the last three years, but not only in the last three years, showing strong signs of following along in the same basic, not identical, of course, basic path that the Soviet Union is moving in. Now, I could put this in, uh, in a sort of shorthand form by saying, is the course China now pursuing, is it Maoist or is it Soviet? Because there was unquestionably very strong differences between Mao's thought and that of the leaders of the Soviet Union. And he expressed these differences in terms of quite sharp criticisms of Stalin's works and of the course adopted and followed by the Soviet Union in the 1950s. Now, we have to understand that this is a struggle between two lines, as they put it in China, that is the one which is uh, Maoist and the other which I think can be reasonably described as Soviet, which goes way back 
in the history of the Chinese Revolution, even before the uh, accession to power in 1949, but most especially after that, and that there are periods of particularly acute struggle between these two lines, most notably the, that which is called the Great Leap Forward in 1957 to 1960. And then, of course, the Cultural Revolution, which begins in 1966 uh, and can be said, I guess, to last, uh, well, anyway, through 1969 or 70, but to not to uh, have persisted in anything like its original strength or form during the last two or three years of Chairman Mao's life. Uh, these two lines have been not only uh, particularly strongly uh, represented and struggled over during the periods of the uh, Great Leap and the Cultural Revolution, but also in other periods. Uh, in fact, they've never been absent altogether, I think. They've been present all along. And they have been associated with various uh, leader, uh, leading figures, particularly Mao on the, on the one side. And unfortunately, there's never been another leader who has had anything like the prestige or deserved, as far as I can see, the prestige of Mao. In fact, his followers were, <coughs> relatively speaking, rather, uh, I would say, uh, weak uh, people. And that's part, of, I think, a great problem of the whole Chinese system of governance. They don't seem to be able, and this is true of both sides in this struggle, to recruit new people and to give the new people the opportunity to develop themselves and to become uh, original and uh, uh, creative leaders. Uh, certainly it's true on Mao's side, uh, and I think the, the, uh, the other side, which has been particularly strongly identified over the years with uh, uh, Liu Xiaoqi, and maybe that's not the way you pronounce it anymore, I don't know, is that still right? I, I can't keep up with the spelling of the Chinese. Uh, and, of course, Deng Xiaoping, who uh, was always a, uh, and Peng Shen and, and many others. But that I raise is, as I said, not whether China is uh, going uh, capitalist or not and lost the road to socialism in that sense, but whether it has lost the peculiarly or is losing or is threatened with a loss of the peculiarly Maoist conception of the road to socialism, which I think was enormously original and creative compared to anything that had happened in the Soviet Union. And whether it has lost that and is now uh, beginning or well along the way or in, in some way or other uh, following a, a road similar to that of the Soviet Union. And uh, the evidence which uh, Jack Gurley presents of a continuity in policy, uh, and he's presented it, by the way, in various written sources much more <coughs> fully and much more, uh, with much more detail than he had time to do tonight, I especially recommend a, <clears throat> a very good piece he wrote <clears throat> in the, uh, I think it was the spring-summer issue of uh, the Stanford Magazine on uh, continuity and change in, in China. Uh, and he has no real difficulty in showing that there is a, a very, very large degree of continuity through the period of Mao's death and the uh, accession to power 
of the regime uh, which followed Mao. Uh, but in my opinion, this is not very, it's evidence, but it, I don't find it very persuasive evidence. I don't think that the real issue is whether China uh, has continued to grow uh, in terms of GNP, in terms of industrial production, in terms of uh, agricultural production, though less, uh, less rapidly. Well, those, these things are all true. Uh, but I don't think these are the, the real issues that we ought to be looking for because, as Jack says, Mao was in favor of these things too. There wasn't all that uh, difference on that level between Mao's line and the line of Yu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. I mean, they, they, they both were in favor of modernization, of uh, acquiring technology from the West, of increasing the forces of production, of increasing output, of uh, modernizing agriculture. One can find uh, can find evidence of this throughout the whole period. And in this respect, I totally agree with, with the thesis which uh, Jack Gurley has been, uh, has been uh, espousing. But it seems to me that the, the real problem is the way the issues which apparently divide these two camps have been treated by the new leadership compared to the way they were treated by Mao and his group before. The fact of the matter, I believe is, and I think uh, uh, Jack Gurley issue, uh, provides plenty of very solid evidence, that there hasn't been any faltering uh, essentially in the, in the development process in China at any time. There have been changes in strategy in various ways, uh, time of the Great Leap and the, and the Cultural Revolution, but basically industrial production has continued to increase at uh, probably the highest rates of any country in the world. GNP has grown, agricultural production has kept ahead of population increase. Uh, and at no time has, uh, has this not been so. Uh, CIA has plenty of figures of that kind. The, the uh, Chinese themselves over the years have put out figures of that kind. But what do we find now? We find in the last couple of years there's an attempt to make out that China went through a period of stagnation which bordered on disaster during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and I rub my eyes when I see this. I mean, I was in China in 1974, gathered quite a lot of material, looked around, saw things. If China was on the verge of an economic collapse at that time, uh, certainly the evidence was not only well hidden uh, in terms of the figures they were giving out, but also well hidden in terms of the uh, of the appearance of the country and, and the people of the country. There seems to be, in other words, now in the last couple of years, and I think it may be getting more virulent rather than less, an effort to discredit everything that happened since about the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. There was a reaction after the Great Leap Forward. Uh, the uh, anti-Maoist line came to the top and was in the ascendancy for a few years there. Uh, but after that, everything has been now judged to be bad, it, uh, failure. China was in a disastrous state. Something had to be done to rescue China from this, this uh, uh, imminent uh, uh, disaster. And at the same time, the effort goes, runs toward rehabilitating everything that happened before the Great Leap Forward. In other words, 
towards uh, reviving the policies and the ideology and the justification of policies which were in vogue uh, in the early 1950s from about uh, from 49 to the time of the Great Leap in 1957. Now that, of course, was precisely the period when China was consciously, consciously copying the Soviet model. Uh, there's no question about that. And Mao was in favor of it, too. Uh, China had to learn from, and there was nothing wrong with that, had to learn from the experience of the first socialist country, uh, the first proletarian revolution. But uh, after about uh, six or seven years of that, it began to appear, particularly to Mao, but also to much wider uh, groups in China, that this was not for China the right road, and that other things ought to be done which were not done in the Soviet Union. Now, I'm not going to go into uh, all the details, but for example, just one example, and a very important one, perhaps the most important one, there was to be no coercive collectivization of agriculture. Uh, that was perhaps the key uh, event in the history of the Soviet Union was the uh, forced collectivization from about 1928 to 1932. Uh, and in various other ways, which culminated in the, uh, culminated in the Great Leap Forward, China was to adopt a different policy, uh, really basically quite, a, quite quite basically different policies from those which the Soviet Union had pursued. And this has a million different facets. The form which I think, uh, ideological form which it took, and uh, which uh, Jack Gurley has already mentioned, was the primacy given to class struggle in the Chinese version that class struggle not only was not to be against the development of productive forces, but was to be in tandem with and furthering the development of productive forces. And what was meant by class struggle? Well, many things. But not only a struggle against old ideas, against the defeated classes in, the Soviet, in China, as say the old bourgeoisie and the feudal classes, the landlord classes, but also a struggle against new class elements in the bureaucracy, in the management structure, among the intellectuals, uh, new elites which were growing up all over the society and which Mao always considered to be a profound threat to the development of a genuinely socialist course. I think there can be no question about that. He once said to uh, uh, Andre, what, what's the name? What's the name of the French fellow Mao had all those uh, convert conversations with? You know, on the uh, oh dear, who? Oh? Can't hear. Anyway. <laughs> who? He was then the French Minister of Culture. He was an old leftist who... Malraux, of course, of course. Andre Malraux, of course. Uh, Mao once said to Andre Malraux that humanity left to itself does not tend to recreate capitalism, but it does tend to recreate inequality. And then he added the tendency to the formation of new social classes is very strong. I think this was close to his, uh, his most uh, inner conviction all along from the very beginning. And I think that this was the basis of his, uh, his most fundamental critique of the Soviet Union, of the Stalinist regime, and where it was leading. 
Now, if we look at where the Soviet Union is today, or where it says it is today, we find that they have developed a quite clearly articulated theory of the nature of Soviet society. It is said to be a society of advanced socialism. Now, what is advanced socialism in this view? It is a society of three social, not classes, but three social elements, two of them classes and one of them a stratum. The two classes are the working class and the peasantry, and the stratum is the intelligentsia. Now, they are not antagonistic in any way. They are all in harmonious, their, their interests are harmonious, they can work together and they do work together. So that the class struggle has been eliminated. What then is it that makes, drives this society forward? If there's no class struggle, which after all, as most of you know, I think, was said to be the motor force of history in classical Marxism, uh, and was supposed to be the motor force of history right up until the achievement of the communist society of the future. Uh, not to be eliminated by socialism, not at all. And in this respect, Mao reflects classical Marxist thought very faithfully. Now, the Soviet answer to this question now is this. What drives this society, this harmonious society of advanced socialism forward is what they call the scientific and technological revolution. And of course, who are the carriers of the scientific and technological revolution? The intelligentsia, of course. So that really the, the, the dominant progressive force in advanced socialism, Soviet style, has become not the working class, certainly not the peasantry, but the intelligentsia, which is the bearer of the scientific and social and technological revolution. And this is supposed to drive Soviet society forward uh, to the ultimate triumph of communism. Well, I can't tell you how totally totally contradictory to Marxism, this idea is. It is just totally out of keeping with anything that Marx or Engels or classical Marxism or Lenin ever held. And I believe from what I have seen, although I can't prove it, and this is certainly an area where we could have a, uh, we could have a debate if, if uh, Jack believes differently. Uh, maybe he can convince me, I don't know. I think that the Chinese are moving in exactly the same direction. They're now soft peddling the class struggle. It's pretty much uh, out except as a struggle against the remnants of the old. Not a struggle against this new class in formation, which by the way, I don't think has to be a capitalist class at all because I don't believe the Soviet Union is a capitalist country. So I think it's a new exploiting class uh, which has grown up under the conditions of the revolution and can grow up in any post-revolutionary society if it is not combated effectively, continuously, and over a long, long period of time. Now, I think Mao's ideas are very consistent with classical Marxism. In fact, I think they are the most advanced and uh, articulate formulation of the ideas of classical Marxism on the problem of the class struggle and the driving forces of society in the post-revolutionary period. Uh, in the, Mar the original Marxist idea, I should go on to say, and then I'll, I think I'm overstepping my limits already, uh, Socialism is not a mode of production or a social formation. It is a transitional stage between capitalism and communism. Now you may say communism is a utopia way off there in the very distant future. 
And perhaps that's correct. I'm not sure. Certainly there's no uh, empirical evidence yet of the appearance of communism. And it doesn't look like it's going to happen when anybody here in this room is still alive. Uh, nevertheless, that is the idea of classical Marxism and of Mao Zedong. And nobody expected that transition to be short. It was to be a long, long historical epoch. And Mao, on various occasions, even said that there would have to be not one cultural revolution, but many cultural revolutions, many struggles, which would take even violent forms before the period of socialism, which was one of transition, one with elements of both capitalism and bourgeois society and communism and communist society mixed into it, before one or the other of those two elements would be victorious. Now Mao, in my opinion, like the Soviet theorists and most Marxists, uh, but not all, was deficient in seeing that in not seeing, rather, that another kind of society was possible post-revolutionary, which was a new class formation, and one where what Mao called the three differences, differences between mental and manual labor, between city and country, and between uh, agriculture and industry, those three differences would be not only not eliminated, but would be in some respects actually intensified. Now Mao's whole thought was that the essence of the struggle for communism was to overcome these three differences. In other words, to overcome inequality, not only in a purely income or monetary sense, but in terms of the real situation of human beings. Uh, and I think that the Chinese now give every evidence of giving up what Mao considered the essence of the struggle to eliminate the three differences, giving up the primacy of the class struggle and trying to divert it into a struggle against old ideas and old uh, prejudices, and giving up the notion of a genuinely democratic society in which the masses would control the party and not simply be represented by or have the party as their agent. Now, those are, to be sure, uh, signs, if they are there, which are not very well developed yet. China, compared to the Russians, hasn't gone very far along this path. And I don't believe that it'll go the whole way that the Russians have gone up to now without very severe struggles. I think there'll be many more of them. I don't believe they're over by any means. I think the idea which, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping and Hua Kofeng and so on believe that they're on to a good course of uh, harmonious modernization is an illusion. I think they're in for some very severe struggles uh, in the next uh, 20 years or so, uh, the period by which they hope to have achieved a, uh, a thoroughly modernized uh, socialist society, socialist, socialism being determined or identified, or, um, defined in their own way. Now, I wouldn't call that socialism. I am a sort of a fundamentalist Marxist, I guess, in some respects. Uh, not, a, not, a, not all by any means, but in some respects. And I think socialism has to be seen as a transition not as a form of society, and something that's going to occupy a long, long period of time. I'm not by any means pessimistic that the Chinese will refine that road, but I think right now there is very clear evidence that the present leadership, those in control now, are trying to develop uh, a set of policies and an ideology which will justify China's, uh, put China on a road similar to, and justify that road similar to that which the Soviet Union has been following for a long time. Thank you. <laughs>
have some comments on that from Dr. Gurley. Just a few brief um, comments. Much of that I, I, I certainly agree with. Um, the question of, um, that was given to me uh, to address, has China lost the road to socialism? I took that seriously. Paul says this is the wrong question. <laughs> um, he may be right. Uh, I think that his question is a, certainly an excellent one, whether the path that China's taking is the same or different from that of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, tried to, I tried to point out that Mao did make a, a definite contribution uh, to finding a path through what Paul calls the transition, socialism, toward a communist uh, society. And that, um, that contribution was in trying to find a way to make production goals and the search for a classless society compatible one with the other. As I expressed it, a way of pursuing one goal and at the same time enhancing the attainment of the other. Now Mao, Mao's own theory about this was fairly well developed, I believe. Uh, there were many slogans on it, such as carry out class struggle and promote production. And that expresses exactly what I'm trying to say, that both those things, in his view, could be carried out at the same time. And not just side by side, but if carried out in the correct way, one would enhance the attainment of the, uh, of the other. Mao felt that, um, uh, that if one uh, carried out class struggles in the correct way, that it would enlist enthusiasm. It would suggest goals that were beyond the immediate uh, needs of the individuals, beyond the, own, the material needs of the individuals, goals that were lofty ones and could in time elicit not only the enthusiasm, but the full participation uh, of people in trying, to, in trying to achieve them. And this in itself would promote the production process. And if the production process were promoted, that that then would put the society materially on a higher plane, which would enable it more easily to develop still higher forms of socialist institutions that could in turn reinforce the goals and the pursuit of those goals that came under, under class struggles. And it was that combination, that trade-off, the complementarity of the two things that I consider to be Mao's main contribution to moving through this transition period. And it is missing, as Paul says. It is certainly missing in the present, uh, in the present environment uh, in China. But the problem really is how to interpret that. Now, if you think, and I don't believe Paul does uh, believe this, that, that there was nothing wrong in the actual carrying out by Mao of this, uh, of this vision of how to, how to move through socialism toward communism, if the Cultural Revolution turned out all right, the Great Leap Forward turned out all right, well then, it is a puzzle as to why the present leaders aren't pursuing this, uh, this course. But if you think, as I do, that uh, this is a very difficult problem, and Mao had not many years to feel his way and to experiment, and even not many opportunities to carry out experiments along these lines, and that these experiments did not turn out perfectly by any means, that there were decided failures with the Great Leap, there were decided failures within the Cultural Revolution. There were setbacks at the end of the Cultural Revolution in education as well as in some areas of, uh, of economics. And people were injured. They were physically injured and psychologically injured by much that went on during the, during the Cultural Revolution. Now, 
if you, if you think of the policies, the results of the policies in those terms, then you can see some reason why this present policies may represent a temporary, a temporary setback to those, why it's almost necessary to now concentrate on building up the production, the productive forces of the society, and perhaps later on, with class struggle still in mind, um, uh, uh, experimenting further along, along the Maoist lines. Now, I don't know whether present leaders have that uh, in mind or not. It may well be that uh, Paul is correct in his assessment that they are going, um, they are going away from classical Marxism, or as I really would say, the Maoist version of that, because I think Mao went beyond classical Marxism and finding a practical way, or at least attempting to find a practical way through socialism toward communism. So it's, it's a question of whether this is a temporary setback or a, a shift in policies after a series of successful ones had been carried on by Mao and, uh, and, and his followers. And I think it's the, I, intend, I, I tend to think it's the former, and Paul seems to stress a little bit more the, oh, the latter. Thank you. Yeah, I think now, now we're getting to the nub of the problem. Uh, of course, the, the Great Leap Forward, I mean, the Cultural Revolution and also the Great Leap Forward were far from perfect performances which achieved all their ends or anything like that. Uh, there were, of course, very bitter struggles uh, which had very little to do with the realization or achievement of any of the ends which Mao and the other uh, theorists had in mind when they uh, not only, well, I, I perhaps wrong to say launched the cult cultural revolution, but at least encouraged it, uh, uh, encouraged it at a time when uh, Liu Xiaoqi and the others would have squashed it right then and there. I think there's no doubt about it. That's what they would have done. Uh, Mao said, no, we've got to let the masses have their head. Let them, let them find out their own way. Uh, and uh, he had such slogans as it justified to rebel and bombard the headquarters, which was all really an attack on the party. It was an attack on the party structure and on the party leadership. And of course, it led to uh, a lot of very unpleasant business. Obviously, people are not, as Mao once said, revolution isn't a tea party. Uh, and it was a real revolution. And I don't think we have any idea, really, those of us who only are reliant on what we're told by uh, the Chinese people we can come in contact with or what we can read. I don't think we really have any idea how profound the bitterness and the difficulties and the struggles were. I get a little bit of a feeling of it from some things I've read by an Italian sinologist, a, a woman by the name of Edoardo Massi, who happened to be, she's been a, a sinologist for a long while, and, and she happened to be teaching in China both before the Cultural Revolution, and she went back in 1977 and taught again. And some of her perceptions of what happened in the Cultural Revolution are really very disturbing. That kind of a struggle can lead to really very uh, distressing and potentially disastrous consequences. Uh, and I think that that is a a very large part of the reason why uh, the, uh, I don't say it's the reason why Mao's policies were, uh, were revised and to a considerable extent abandoned after his death. I think that would have happened anyway. But it was a large part of the reason why many people were relieved and welcomed the change uh, because the tensions and the, the, uh, uh, 
the bitterness of the, of the Cultural Revolution period, the struggles let loose in that period, uh, were really threatening to a large part of the Chinese population. But Masi has, uh, also has some of the other side to the picture. During the Cultural Revolution, educational policies were changed and uh, entrance uh, into the universities was not long, no longer by strict examination and by our cultural attainment, and basically that means class origin, but were on political grounds, and that of course leads to a great many abuses, no question. But she was teaching in a high school, and she depicts what happens when once again the exam system comes in. I've just been in Japan for a month. Believe me, that exam system is one of the horrors of the world. Every small Japanese child from the word go is trained to realize that your life is going to be determined by a certain number of examinations. If you have for life, you're going into the higher echelons of the corporate and the government world. If you fail, if your family is rich enough, they can still send you to a private university, and you'll do all right. But if you're poor and you fail out at that stage, you're finished. You're going to be nothing the rest of your life except an ordinary schmo uh, of a working man. Or you're not going up into any higher echelons. There's no way up after that point. Now, that seems to be the kind of thing which they're thinking in terms of, and it's got a long, long tradition in Chinese history. It's the Confucian tradition of the examination system. That was a large part of the, uh, the, a big part of the detonator of the Cultural Revolution was a revolt against that kind of a system. Now, I don't think they solved it. I don't think the Cultural Revolution solved it. I don't think Mao had solutions for it either. These are really very profound problems, very profound conflicts. There's no easy way out of them. What distresses me is the way the post-Maoist leadership handled them. Did they go in for a serious discussion and criticism of what was done, what was done right, and what was done wrong? No, not at all. They invented these fairy tales about the Gang of Four all kinds of incredible nonsense has been put forward. I think anybody has to admit that. But no serious analysis of what went wrong. No summoning the masses to a, a discussion of the problems which were, and the mistakes which were made. No questioning of the whole. It all became black and white. That was a bad period, even to the point of denying the things that weren't so bad. The production and the, uh, the growth the policies were pretty good during the Cultural Revolution, considering the severity of the struggles that went on. That's what bothers me. I think this group in power now is not by any means a bunch of communists. They came up out of the Communist Party, of course. I think they are representatives of a new ruling class in Nashendi, in the process of being born. And they represent that class, and they mean to impose that kind of a society on China. Now, if that is to be overcome, it's not going to be through their goodwill. It's going to be because the masses of Chinese who are still down at the bottom, the peasants and the workers, Believe me, they're better off than they were before the revolution, but it's no picnic. They're very poor still. And if they are going to continue on a, on a path which is going to lead them to power, and that's not an easy concept, but I think it's not a meaningless one either, then they've got to struggle and do it themselves. And that's the problem, which seems to me to be at the heart of the present historical junction in China.
Okay, we're now ready for some questions from the audience. May I please ask that you try to keep your questions short and to the point so that we can cover as many as possible without going on for too long of a time. Do we have some questions? You can direct them to either both of the speakers or to just one of them. I wish I could answer the question. I think it's a very good question. Why was it that Mao wasn't able to develop some kind of a, a movement, uh, a support, organized support, which would enable his line in the two-line struggle to survive his death? And I really don't know the answer. I think there were plenty of signs that the the, uh, the gang of four uh, who were made scapegoats for so much were not particularly uh, talented Maoists uh, and didn't, uh, weren't especially good politicians either. Uh, Mao, of course, always knew when to compromise. He was a, he was a master compromiser, and you have to be if you're in politics. Uh, and they didn't seem to have that skill at all. And uh, of course, I think uh, that the party cadres on the whole, who were pretty badly mauled around in the Cultural Revolution, nevertheless, uh, for the most part, did survive and just bided their time and really were in control. And I don't think, in retrospect, although I didn't see it at the time, I admit that. In retrospect, I think probably that particular cultural revolution never had a chance. The, the cards were very strongly stacked against it. But I don't think that deprives it, of its, it deprives it of its historical importance, not only in China, but also for the world socialist movement. I think it will be, uh, it's, a, it's an achievement, a level of understanding uh, which has been reached and can never be lost now. And I believe that uh, every new revolution, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about one like the Iranian revolution, which obviously never had a real revolutionary uh, leadership developed to the point where it could, uh, uh, it could get out of the mess in which Iran was mired. Uh, never had a meaningful program to tackle those problems. Uh, but I think uh, a revolution in a country, well, let's take a very simple case and, and a, a, a very backward case too, in Mozambique, for example. They are very aware of all these issues that have been fought out in the Chinese, uh, uh, in the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And that's, uh, Mozambique and, and China are, uh, not only thousands of miles away geographically, but in time and every other way, culturally and civilizationally and so on. They're two different worlds. And yet that experience, uh, China's attempt to uh, break with the Soviet model and go on what I would consider a more genuinely socialist course, that experience can never be wiped out now, and I think future revolutions will take up from there and go ahead. And I think it will happen in China too, but after what kind of struggles, I don't know. The thing that I fear most is that, uh, that some kind of a, a real Stalinist kind of regime may at some stage be clamped down and that further political development will be made almost impossible as it was in the Soviet Union. 
uh, with Stalin's purges and the, the total change in the political power structure in the, uh, in the late 20s and, well, especially in the mid-30s with the wiping out of the old party, the old Bolsheviks. Now, I, I don't, I just say I fear this. I don't think any of us know what's going on in the younger levels of Chinese society, really. We get some lurid pictures of uh, uh, youth gangs and robbery and whatnot in the bourgeois press in the big cities, and probably that's true. But what's going on in the countryside among young people, uh, in the lower levels of the, uh, of the political uh, uh, the people who are running the country, the younger people, I, I haven't seen anything that, that really uh, conveys to me any believable picture, so, so I have no way of judging those things. I guess to say that I think that uh, many of uh, Mao's policies uh, uh, did survive, the ones on concerning economic uh, production, many of them in foreign trade, and foreign policy certainly has survived almost, almost intact. The key one, however, that we're addressing ourselves to is the uh, one involving the combination of class struggles in, and production, and that did not survive at the leadership level. Nobody knows how much it has survived uh, below that. It may have, it may have a, a real survival uh, value at the, uh, among many of the people uh, of, of China. There is one other aspect um, um, uh, to this. Uh, it's a question of why Mao brought Deng Xiaoping back uh, uh, in, into power, because he apparently is the person not carrying out this key aspect and doesn't, perhaps does not believe in this key aspect of the, the Maoist program. Now, I don't know, that probably has a lot to do with the Mao's deep enmity of the Soviet Union, because Deng Xiaoping had proved himself over the years to be as anti-Soviet as, uh, as Mao, and there was a key point around 1973 when it was Mao felt that uh, the military needed to be shaken up and it would be a good idea to bring Deng back just from an anti-Soviet uh, point of view. It may be that that, uh, that deepest conviction of Mao about the Soviet Union got in the way, actually, of some domestic programs that might have been carried out by other leaders. Well, I think the mechanism is, um, uh, is, is one of uh, reducing the, uh, the income disparities among the units at one level as production teams or, or brigades. You see, if they're uh, a basic account, I didn't have time to, to say this, uh, but I imagine that many of you know it, a, a basic accounting unit means that one's income is um, determined by the work done by that particular group. Now, a production team may consist of 20 families, 30 families, or something like that. Uh, my income as a member of that production team is determined by uh, the amount of work done by all the members, including myself, because my own work points are divided into the total product that all of the members of the production team uh, a turn out. The worth of a work point, the value of a work point, is determined 
uh, not so much by what I'm doing, but by what everybody else, uh, what everybody else in the production team is doing. If I've got a very close relationship to the other members of the group, I continue to work hard within the group. Now, if you move the basic product, uh, the, the basic accounting unit up a notch to a much larger group, let's say consisting of 200 or 300 families, then any individual may not know other individuals within that larger group and feel that the group is now so large that he or she can uh, reduce one's effort without reducing the value of one's work points. I mean, let the other uh, thousand people work hard and your work points uh, then will, will, be worth, will be worth a lot. And so and it's the, the problem is to keep is, is to gain larger groups but maintain the work incentives so within these larger groups. But the prior problem, the prior problem is to, to move the basic accounting unit, to get people to agree to move the basic accounting unit up a notch. Now if the production teams have great disparities among them in income, one is very wealthy and one is very poor, the wealthy one is not going to agree to it because it's owned the value then of its work points would be diluted by the poor performance of the, other, of the other teams within the brigade. And so they would simply say no, they wouldn't do it. But if the industries owned by the brigade can be expanded over time, earn a large enough income to be used to help the poorest ones along and bring them all up, reducing the disparities, then that aspect of it is, is eliminated and you can more easily get general agreement to move the basic accounting unit uh, up a notch. And that's the type of mechanism that I was uh, trying to describe. And I think, it's, I think that is in place and is being encouraged. And that, to me, is, is, a, is a very encouraging sign that uh, the, the authorities mean some business. Well, I had spoken of two lines within the party, and the questioner says that uh, one often reads of, of uh, the third line, the ultra-leftists, who are usually depicted as being quite destructive. Uh, I think uh, it's always very difficult to say exactly who was on which side of two lines, and undoubtedly there were uh, extreme extremist factions uh, on both sides, each claiming to be the perfect Maoist and the most, uh, the, the only true representative of the, of the revolutionary position and so on. If you ever read William Hinton's uh, book called The Hundred Days War, that uh, uh, the uh, Tsinghua University in, in uh, Peking, uh, sort of the MIT of China, uh, that uh, the, the insanity of some of the factionalism is really uh, unbelievable and very hard to make any sense out of. But uh, a lot of that went on, and a lot of uh, there were sort of ultras on all sides, and when the struggle heated up, uh, I don't really think you can speak of a, of a third line. Uh, different from, or not, let me put it this way, not related to one or, one or the other of the basic lines I was talking about, which uh, I define oversimplified, of course, but as the Maoist or the Soviet lines, because objectively, I think that most of the struggles were moving uh, around those issues rather than all about some third issue, which uh, kind of the ultra left certainly had a, uh, at various times a very anarchist uh, uh, coloration. People who were just uh, an anarchism is not 
not, is not foreign to the world socialist movement, as I'm sure you know. I mean, there's always been a strong element of anarchism, uh, and it gets into the into the political struggles. It was in France in 1968, for example. It always was in the Latin countries, and I think probably that was true in China as well. So. Uh, one has to distinguish between particular struggles and particular factions and basic lines. That's, that's the way I would try to answer the question. Yes. Dr. Sweezy hinted that China may be following the Soviet model, the new China since Mao. If that is so, how do you explain this anti-Soviet move on the part of China, especially in the area of foreign policy, in the liberation struggle of Angola, China is anti-MPLA. How do you explain those moves? Uh, well, I, we didn't get into the question of Chinese foreign policy, and I think the only mention of it was that uh, Jack really pointed out that there's a very considerable uh, almost total identity or continuity between the uh, policies in, the, in uh, Mao's period, uh, at least the last years of Mao's, uh, Mao's uh, life when he was <coughs> presumably responsible for foreign policy as well as domestic, uh, and that of the post-Maoist regime. And I agree entirely with that, and I think that uh, 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 I think that, from my point of view, this is a, a, an anti-socialist, anti-communist uh, foreign policy. But I don't give the Soviet Union any great credit for what it's done <coughs> in particular circumstances, where it's, uh, as far as I can see, is furthering its own interests vis-a-vis -vis the other superpower, which is the United States, and to a certain extent China uh, as well, in its, for example, in its stance in, uh, in the Horn of Africa. I think the Soviet policy towards Eritrea is every bit as bad as the Chinese policy has been in certain other African situations. And uh, I'm afraid that there isn't any such thing as a socialist foreign policy by anybody in, in the world today. And socialism isn't that well developed. It's a, these post-revolutionary societies are, uh, uh, it's not only that they're nationalist, but also that they have uh, interests to defend which are often at cross purposes or contradictory to those of revolutionary movements and in other countries and other parts of the world. Uh, I, I deplore this, but I would be foolish if I tried to deny its existence. Yes. Well, it's in one disagreement between you two gentlemen. It's about the Cultural Revolution period and during which China has uh, implemented the Maoist economic line. And uh, uh, one thing that you seem to Um, yeah, there, there, uh, there are data on the uh, on the production uh, part of it, and I uh, I agree with uh, with Paul Sweezy in that I don't think we have any differences in that uh, in that regard. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, if you measure production by the gross national product, uh, gross national product fell for a year for a year and a half, but not not very much. Uh, it certainly wasn't disturbed as it was in 1960-61 after, after the Great Leap Forward. From 1969 on, that is after the first frenetic wave was over of the Cultural Revolution, there were still 
aspects of the Cultural Revolution going on in the 1970s. But after that first wave was really over with, from 1969 up to Mao's death in 1976, uh, China had a very, very good economic uh, record. It was a uh, industrial production gain per annum of about 11 percent, agricultural gains of around 4 uh, percent per annum. There were some really good things being done with a move from 1969-1970 on uh, in, in outward-looking in outward-looking types of policies, that is, in, in more trade with, uh, with other countries, especially with uh, capitalist countries. Uh, a lot of technology, modern technology, was being imported from 1969 to 1976. This is one of the reasons that I give for uh, the basis of the conclusion that there were many continuities between the Maoist uh, uh, at least the last period of, of the Maoist, the Maoist, Mao's life and, and the post-Mao period. Um, so I, I really don't have much quarrel within that area. In fact, I have no quarrel with Paul within that area. But I do have quarrels within other areas. That is how the Cultural Revolution turned out on, on the whole. Mao was very disappointed with it. He expressed his disappointment uh, many times in 1968, 1969, that uh, things had really gotten, gotten away, that the, the factional fights, just for factional fights, uh, people were abused, uh, the educational system was dismantled, and I certainly agree with Paul that, uh, that uh, the direction of, of intended change was, was, a very good, was a very good one, but it wasn't put back together again. It was that way seven years, almost seven years uh, later. Uh, much of that's also true within science and technology and within certain areas of the, of the economy, too, uh, too. I'm sure we all have different views about culture, you know, what uh, involves, what, what shapes a good culture of a, of a society. But my own personal judgment is that the, the, the culture is better. No, the wider fare, richer fare being given to the, to the Chinese, both in, in, written, in written literature and plays and ballets and, and, and music and, and, and whatnot, that this is, this is all to the good and it was still the fight. Yeah, I find many things that went wrong with the, with the, with the cultural uh, revolution and perhaps it's in some of those areas that, uh, that we differ, but not in the economic uh, area. Paul, do you want to add anything to that? You needn't. <laughs> yes. I'm proud of the speech. If I understood it all, you would think that in the socialist countries today, in Russia and the, and the Russian follower socialist countries, there is a new kind of exploitation, a new kind of growth or class, I think I'm correctly. But personally, I don't Hungarian society, for instance, a minister earns less than three times more money than an average worker. I think the party official in the party bureaucracy, the top leaders, earn the same amount. And if we're taking into account the second account that the workers have an additional income, I can say, I, I can say you that uh, the workers even could earn more, more money than ministers in Hungary very easily. There are many millionaires, but they are not party officials and not members of the so-called new bourgeoisie. But they are, they are rather workers or peasants or such a type of people. So I, I don't, don't know really what is this new kind of exploitation. Who is it? Well, this is a question today. It's a very complicated set of problems, and uh, I don't propose to pretend to be able to give a good answer to it in a few minutes. I, uh, I would say it's not entirely or even largely a matter of monetary income. 
this is this particular kind of a judgment comes from uh, our using capitalist standards to judge every other kind of society, whether they happen to be capitalist or not. Uh, the, uh, it's a question of power, really. That's what we mean by a class, a ruling class. Now, do you maintain that, uh, not that you and I can have a debate here, I know that, because uh, this is a rhetorical question. Uh, can you maintain, can one maintain that uh, the ordinary workers in the Eastern European countries, and I, I take the Soviet Union as the oldest and best example, have any real power uh, over their own work processes or over the disposition of their product? Uh, or is it not true that there is a concentration of power in a very limited segment of the society, which is basically self-reproducing, isn't really uh, recruited from all elements of society. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm all wrong about this. Yeah, I think so. You are wrong. Yeah, I, I the Soviet know. Union too. I, I don't know the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union, in my opinion, is the one that's important for China and for the subject we're discussing right now. Maybe, let me admit, Hungary and Poland may be totally different phenomena, in which case we would have to have another evening on that. I don't want to get into it because I really don't know much. I have spent quite a lot of time studying the Soviet Union. And that's the one I w wanted to compare with China. So I'm a little afraid that if we get into Hungary too far, we may just uh, pull the wool over our, our drag a red herring across the path. That's <laughs> could I, Gene, could I just say, I'd like to just say one, one word, it's sort of theoretical word. I don't know, I can't answer about, uh, about Hungary uh, uh, either. But the, but the theoretical word is that, um, is that I think it's terribly hard to get at this question by saying, asking yourself which class has the power and whether exploitation is going on and what form does it take. The, if it's true that, that uh, the, the bourgeoisie is back in power and there's something like a capitalist restoration, then one would expect to see the results of it in the business cycles that would be, that would be generated by, by, that type of, uh, by that type of mode, mode of production. One would expect to see it in the uh, in the wealth and poverty nexus. One would expect to see it in other areas that Marx pointed out. What was it called? Is that chapter 25 of volume one of, uh, of Capital? <laughs> the capitalist accumulation process. Uh, absolute very, law of capital accumulation. Absolute law of capitalist accumulation.